we're back for season two. Um, and today there are three of us around the table, so let's go around. I'm obviously Liam Henderson. Joanna's us back from our holidays. <laughs> and we have... Um, you have Deb Carson. Thank you for um, having me. Very exciting. Isn't it? Yes. Who are you, Deb? Who am I? Do you want me to say who I am? Um, well, I am uh, Head of Operations for High Speed Rail Industry Leaders, which is a, um, an industry group that supports high speed rail. I wear a few hats, actually, because I'm like a freelance. So um, I also am an associate for um, an organisation called Green Gauge 21, also doing rail research more widely than just high speed. And... I've got my other hat on, I suppose, which is um, from local government, where I had a previous life and career um, for the local government association and lots of other councils and public sector organisations doing work on equality and cohesion and inclusion. So this podcast is very interesting to me. It's topic for today. Yes. So just as an aside, point is that we have previously worked together for Rail Innovation Group events. Yes. So we may be referencing some events, just so people know that we already know each other. Yes, we do. We know each other. Have us some cake. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh! Johanna finally made me cake last week. I know. And you know, it's like before before we go on. I was going to bring cake today, but then they have a policy of only eating food. Um, at, um, so we're at the Royal Society of Arts today, and they have a policy of because they are a charity and they rely on. <laughs> I'm just going to casually cover up my banana skin at this point because I didn't know that. <laughs> they rely on. The, the money they make from the food, they don't like you to bring stuff in, so I didn't. So, um, so I didn't bring anything in. But we are very much on the low. But I have been thinking, though, if innovation was a cake, what type of cake would it be? Just to randomly go off on another subject for a few marmalade minutes. Marmalade and marrow. Why marmalade and marrow? It just makes people uncomfortable and shiver. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really bad joke, <laughs> and I think you need to think about it more seriously. <laughs> Because cake are very, is very serious and shouldn't be joked about. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, innovative cake. I don't know. I saw a few on Bake Off last night. That would have been pretty. Baked Alaska that shouldn't work but does. Yeah. Amazing. So I've been thinking about designing a cake for our group. Okay. Okay. So I've been thinking about it, but I haven't thought about what type of cake it should be yet. My expectations are very high already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because I have made new types of cakes, but they usually involve alcohol, so I don't think that would be very good for rail. So. <laughs> no, it does have to be alcohol-free for that. Mm. Mm. Well, we'll that's see. interesting, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> we'll have to give that some serious thought. Right. Down to business. Okay, down to business, yes. Right, okay, so we are sat in the library of the RSA in central London and we're going to be talking today about inequality in transport which was a subject that Deb chose so before we sort of like get into it why did you choose this subject? Um, Well I chose it for two reasons really one is because I find it interesting that there is such a strong connection between transport and inequality equality whichever way around you want to have it and and for me that's interesting because as I said before I used to work in, in in local government on equality and inclusion um, policy and have sort of moved into rail in the last, I don't know, eight or nine years I suppose. I've worked in rail so I'm a real newbie to rail because obviously most people have been in rail their whole lives. Um, and so it's, it's interesting for me that my two worlds are kind of colliding in that sense and it's not something that's particularly obvious when you first think about how transport might be able to um, you know counter some of the inequalities that we have in society actually when you start to look at it you realize that it's it's a sort of critical component really to a more sustainable and equal society so um, yeah I think it's a really interesting topic I mean we could probably only touch on certain bits of it today because there's so much to it but yeah it might pique people's interest to go away and I think it is I mean I think as you said it is a wide subject and it's really interesting because I'm, I'm, I am going to call myself a girly swat because <laughs> girly squats are trending at the moment so I think I'm going to take that title up but I did a lot of research and reading into this and I've never really thought about it before about how 
how big the subject is because when we think of inequality we tend to think of you know disability groups you know because we talk about that but the subject is so much wider than that and and, and I found myself getting really angry yeah. you know at the way you know transport does impact or public transport actually it's all transport isn't it yeah. on on you know people's ability to be able to access work education um, leisure facilities shopping hospital all sorts of things and how that and how that does you know, you know your ability to you know not just access it but to have opportunity mm. Yeah, yeah, and there's lots and lots of evidence to, 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 to show that it has, um, it, you know, it's a critical component, really, in whether um, whether areas are, um, you know, economically active or inactive and whether they're kind of moving up the social mobility scale or whatever, you know, whatever scale you care to look at. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge thing. I mean, I don't, I mean, I think for the purposes of this, in my head, I'd kind of set aside the... the the whole kind of you know the, the disability and that kind of side of, the, uh, of inequality just because I mean let's face it we all appreciate that for example train operators and you know anyone you care to mention have still got quite a long way to go to be able to make their services completely inclusive for people that have got any kind of impairment so that's kind of a much that's almost an easier thing to kind of you know get your head around really isn't it the fact that, um, yeah you know, and I think in, um, in the research, when I'm mean, because one of the things that um, comes up a lot is less about rail travel because um, rail travel, there's a lot of places in the country that don't have access to rail, yeah. so they're dependent on either the car or a bus, yes. and particularly low income groups. And that was really what was making me angry because both of those policy areas particularly in the last 10 years have really impacted on those groups of people yeah yeah and I, I mean I think if you look at if you if you're looking at inequality in terms of social mobility and economic inequality which is um, obviously a big driver with you know the government looking at productivity and all that, all that kind of thing um, there are uh, that that kind of notion of having a transport a, a completely integrated transport system I think is where you kind of have to start because every, you know you have to it, it has to cover all modes of transport you know to be able to for people to be able to use transport effectively to move themselves into places of where they have more opportunities or where they can go become more you know have more skills um, all that kind of thing it's it's reliant on um, a completely integrated transport system and that's something that you know in this I mean we don't even have a proper transport strategy in this country which is to me shocking actually well, well because, you're right um, you know there's many different government departments looking at inequality and you know higher you know trying to improve particular you know certain areas that have come, gone into industrial decline and all that kind of thing and productivity and to me transport's the biggest thing in that in that argument and yet we don't have a national transport strategy but yeah i think that was one of the things that was striking me in my in my research was that it's just across everything a complete lack of integrated policy it's not even just a lack of transport policy there was no correlation between I mean, I've always said you know um, about you know one of the reasons why if you only have to look at the National Transport Survey travel survey that the Department of Transport has carried out every year what since 1967 or something mm. and that's showing that we're not traveling less we're not necessarily doing any more journeys but what we're doing is we're traveling further distances and that's obviously related to housing Yes. and the fact that people can't live in you know people who earn median incomes or are on lower incomes cannot live in city centers and this was also something that was coming up in a trend worldwide as mm. well is that what you're getting is with gentrification that you're getting rich enclaves in the city centers as they become more gentrified again and then the poor the poor and the middle classes are living in in the in the suburbs and as a result of that anything you do with transport policy is actually the burden is being put on the lower income earners so if you put the cost of fuel up, 
because you're reliant on your car because you don't necessarily have the access to the public transport mm. that is you know affecting you disproportionately the cost of rail fares is affecting you disproportionately yeah. but then you know, I mean but that's just you know, housing but they um, but they are sort of like they're saying that 10 percent of all hospital appointments are missed because people can't get to the hospital because they yeah. don't have access to public transport yeah. and where's the research into that because surely the, for the cost of a bus service yeah I mean it's interesting <laughs> Green Gage actually have done some a, a really interesting piece of work on in, into urban buses which if anyone wants to have a look at access that they can on the Green Gage 21 website um, because it's a really key you know, piece of the jigsaw in terms of you know proper integrated transport is those is, is the bus services and um, you know there's it's, it's it's tricky, isn't it? The the, the model I think that is a, is kind of applied to to, to to when you are looking at um, transport improvements is also not particularly fit for purpose. As tea pouring noise there. <laughs> Because actually, when you it, it, it relies on um, the, the transport strategy relies on passenger growth to bring new services in, but actually, in a lot of areas where there is, you know, high unemployment or you know, particularly low wages, you're not going to have that passenger growth to be able to, you know, apply the formula to be able to improve the transport things. So it needs business cases. So the business case is there. First episode was on the fact that you need a business case for everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's the, but it's the way that you build the business case is the, is the issue, isn't it? Because if you're looking at other... If you are bringing in other other pieces of the jigsaw around the kind of whole inequality story, if you're looking at, I don't know, other factors like um, health inequality, you know, all those kind of things that are extremely costly, actually, to the national economy, then if you built a... A, a better model around picking up some of that stuff then actually I would suggest but that you would be able to build a business case for that kind of thing but it's just that we're looking in the wrong places aren't we I think we're, we're, um, we're trying to be able to assist in that house societal benefits in the I think I'm gonna have you I'm gonna obviously I'm gonna within transport policy um, a lot of um, transport improvements are measured in terms of the government handbook under web tag and the passenger ma demand um, handbook and, and all the rest of it but there has been movements to try and measure some of the social benefits and to move more onto benefit frameworks have you done any work on that so that you can measure more of those intangible benefits yeah i, I, I haven't personally done any work on that i mean there has been lots of work done on that and um, i mean green gauge have done quite a lot of work on that but not that something that i've been in particularly involved with but i mean kpmg have done work that looks at kind of how connectivity I think the last report that they did the study showed that a 10% impr I mean they use the in in index of multiple deprivation I think oh in yeah their studies um, but that I think they found that a 10% improvement in connectivity um, gave um, a 3.6% improvement in economic social and environmental deprivations and figures which is quite impressive actually if you think about that and it's something that I don't know whether, whether on, in your research you looked at the um, UK 2070 commission they've been uh, the, um, that commission was set up I can't remember when um, but it's just reported its second set of findings and again Green Gage has done some work to kind of support some, some of that policy area but they talk about requiring a connectivity revolution to um, counter some of the massive regional in, um, inequalities yeah. in, in, across, across so the country. On that, would you, what is your feeling? So obviously in the press today at the moment it's all about the coastal communities, mm. deprivation in coastal communities, lots of which have train stations near the end of the line. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, with regard to transport and policy, are we trying to pull economic growth to these extremely isolated regional places, or are we trying to improve people's access from those places to the places where there's existing economy? Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think you, you would probably say to some extent both. I mean, if you're trying to build a local, a better local economy, then obviously you want people to be able to. Um, 
for example when you're looking at people going to um, seek out training for example and if you look at the evidence it tells you that a lot of people will go to cities or be sent into cities like apprentices will go to cities because it's easier to get from one place to another and, you know that they'll go to where the easiest transport link is um, so actually that's to the detriment of the local area where they could be training providers you know that are just not particularly accessible and I suppose if you sort of take that thought and that model and apply that across any number of areas then you are then if you're encouraging constantly encouraging people out of your area to access yeah. all of that then you're not building your own local base and for anything whether it's productivity economic growth or anything and, else and it's kind of like yeah you know, and just taking that a step further is you know when we were exploring earlier about lack of <coughs> integration is that the feeling I got in the research because of this urbanisation and because you are pulling things into centres I think actually that's what's affecting our our high streets because local small towns they're not getting the people during the week because people are being pulled into urban centres mm. to support a local economy yeah. and so it kind of it, it's almost like a vicious circle that we're, we're creating unsustainable towns yeah. you know where people are being drawn in you know we're traveling longer distances we're getting there faster um, by train or by car or not yeah and we're not actually sustaining our local economies and we're creating huge dormitory towns yeah. all over the place yes and that that has implications for services it has implications for businesses and so only big cities or big towns can sustain in the future so to cover off the obvious elephant inside of the room is that both of we all have experience in the HS2 which is building a rail line from the middle of a big city to another big city focusing everything in the big city how are we, how are we comfortable with that doing reinforcing what you just said does well, it or what's it doing to well I think it's part of a bigger picture isn't it or it should be I mean that's I mean for me the important thing and something that does concern me is that if, I'm, if you're talking about kind of you know government strategy and how government approaches this kind of thing is that it's part of that you know HS2 is a critical part of the carbon narrative that we you know we've just signed up to um, net zero by 2050 I think obviously HS2 is a huge um, part of that um, it's also a big part of the bigger sort of moving away from the sort of um, you know everything emanating from London actually to try and shift all of that transport development up into the Midlands and the North is, re is a really important bit of trying to get that much more inclusive connectivity it's not that it's not the end of the story it won't it it's not in I itself mean, going to yeah. going to make that happen and what's awesome. worrying is that if you're nitpicking away at it sorry but I'm going to mention the Oakley review you know that's why I think it's so important to have you know for example you know why was the National Infrastructure Commission set up it was set up to take the, a big picture view of what infrastructure is important in the UK and take the politics, take out, the politics out, of out of it because actually you know some th these are things that are crucial you know broad, broad, broadband speed um, you know transport they're the, they're the, the key you know housing and housing and planning they're key things that really need to be thought about in a completely integrated way and they all and that and it all has such an impact on um, you know whether we actually try and build a less um, unequal society and actually have a more balanced economy right across the country is, is, is critical. I think I'm I sounding like a politician. I mean, you um, are, I think you're right. It is vital to the economic growth, particularly for the Midlands and north of Manchester and beyond, because it will have. I mean, although. You know, people say oh, it's going to benefit London more and all the rest of it. I don't think it will. It will drive. I think it will drive business out of London. You can already see the evidence of that happening in Birmingham, for example, where business is already starting to move to Birmingham. But also, I think that part of the problem with HS2, and I don't want to make this about HS2, is that because the publicity on HS2 ever since it was conceived has been defensive 
that actually they feel as they've had to sell a story on capacity but actually given the, the carbon requirement actually high speed 2 has the opportunity to do what high speed rail has done in France and in Japan and take airplanes out of the sky mm. and that's really what it should be focusing in on on taking you know on taking domestic travel away from Heathrow and I know that won't be popular for a lot of people but HS2 will be link will be able to link Heathrow Birmingham Airport and Manchester Airport and that is one of the, the, the London Manchester corridor of people interchanging once they arrive into the UK from all over the world is one of the biggest flights so actually if you re-examine it you might not actually need the third runway at Heathrow if you focus on the speed of HS2 and that is good that's got to be good for the climate hasn't it and that's got to be good for the economy of the UK because actually that is you know people flying and interchanging at Heathrow doesn't do much to benefit the UK economy no. whereas high speed 2 and people interchanging into a domestic rail service will do a lot for the economy of the UK mm. and also the you know the, the, the Scottish narrative around that which is that they want to be able to you know get to Scotland in less than three yeah. hours which again is comparable with a with the domestic flight, so you know, and that should be the story. Yeah, it yeah. should be, you know, be, it should be competing with air. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, it's the, you know, not just not just the that the, the narrative for carbon around aviation, but also you know the the stations for HS two are being are going, you know being right in cities, which actually as you say is a is a you know you can look at that either way, but in terms of carbon. That means that you're not changing your transport. You know, you're not changing onto different modes of transport. You're, you're going right into the city in one in one journey. So it's a lot of transport to those stations. Is yeah. The, well, this is where the, but that this is where the the integrated transport comes in, and it's absolutely that's cr that's such a critical part of the thing. You know, um, and and in some areas, I mean, in the the green gauge report that I mentioned earlier. Um, the work that they've done to support the, the the UK 2070 Commission, you know, they've picked out. I say they, we've picked out some very specific um, and quite easy wins around, you know, changing, um, you know, bus routes and stuff like that to, yeah. to actually improve connectivity. Yeah. and that's way beyond what you would. What and you would and that actually imagine. is about. Um, interdependency of the policies again mm. isn't it and collaborating together to ensure that you know we get the benefits because you know it's one of the other bits of research that I you know I looked into when um, when we had this topic was about actually about active transport you know uh, well, and I think it's interesting this term active transport it actually means walking and cycling and I think you know we should be and scooting or whatever you know and shared mobility and all the rest of it and we should be you know we should be in terms of breaking down some of those barriers of inequality we should be looking more at that because linking back to the health again again um, because we tend to design everything around the car particularly you know in city centers and things and not actually designing it for the cyclist the pedestrian and that yeah. we're actually creating more inequalities because we're making people's health worse you know and mm. that's all linked to the carbon and everything and, and if we're really serious about this some of these challenges that we have we can actually turn them around by thinking about these policies better yeah yeah yeah, yeah. All that kind of smart transport planning is so important, isn't it? Because, you know, on the one hand, everyone's kind of being told they need to get fitter and do this, that and the other. But actually, a lot of places are designed so poorly that you can't walk comfortably well, from one place to another. Well, when actually, you, 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 know, you could do the distance, but you just couldn't do... Well, you, you can't you know, get to where you... I think... Yeah. <laughs> but I think <laughs> this was the thing, was that um, I, you know... Um, one of the things that I picked up, you know, one of the statistics I picked up was that um, roads, um, transport, are responsible for 26 percent of UK greenhouse gases. Mm. And since, you know, since when when was the climate change? Um, when was um, Kyoto? Um, oh, 1998. Right, yeah, it has not yeah. changed. Mm. So, in terms of transport, we have made no no changes at all even with you know technology changing up because and it's and I think I, I saw a piece in the news about um because it was in Germany about how they're thinking of banning um 
SUVs, aren't they? Yes. Right. <laughs> because of the fact that um, so people aren't driving small cars anymore but what is is any benefits that you've got from the innovation in the improved engines and that you've just made up for by um, having bigger engines mm. so they're thinking about banning them in order to you know to Germany and countries now just approved a giant open cars line to reopen this <laughs> <laughs> I know it's bonkers isn't it but um, but I think of course was that um, because of all this you know when sort of like we're talking about the inequalities and that because you know you've got transport dependency and transport <laughs> poverty and that is and reliance on cars and not necessarily being able to actively walk was that um, people that live near roads they you know they they're more um, they're more likely to die younger they're more likely to um, have um, worse pregnancy outcomes oh. more likely to have asthma in children yeah. you know and we've seen stuff in the news about well, in um, schools that's been really really um, it, that's been a key part of why the um, why the mayor has taken the decisions that he has done on, on um, car use isn't mm. it is because of those instances of asthma in particular and boroughs I think and I sort of like another statistic that I picked up was that Royal College of Physicians um, have Assess that there are 40,000 premature deaths a year because of the way we design our roads and that we haven't made any inroads into into our transport policy and that um, it also leads to obesity mm. because we're not designing environments where people can walk and cycle yeah. you know so it is so this is becoming a, a barrier to active travel and causing sedentary behaviours yeah yeah so it's leading to sort of health inequalities and shorter life expectancy and all that kind of stuff it's I mean that's it's not something you'd automatically think of when you think of transport is it but no it's quite a, but it's quite incredible actually some of those statistics and and although yeah, I've picked scary. this stuff stuff up because this, this this has all come out of a government report mm. Um, that was done not by the tra not by the Department for Transport, but by the um, the Chief Scientific Officer, mm -hmm. and it was published this year. So a lot of this information's come out of there. Was that they've said, you know, urgent action is needed to understand how we address this. And yeah, and I think you know, I'm not going I'm not going to mention the irrelevant in the room, but you know, that's <laughs> part of the problem at the moment, isn't it? That nothing else is happening in government. No. <laughs> yeah, because of the wider <laughs> political situation. So how so how do how do we accept accept that generally emissions go down when there's a recession because there's always economic activity. <laughs> Yippee! <laughs> <laughs> so that's one good bit. So so when no we're so infrastructure being built. So but so, so, no. so, so, so when we've all returned to nineteen twenties poverty. Yes, exactly. We'll be fine. <laughs> We can all just walk on it in our shoes that are all worn out. We can't afford anymore. I really can't wait. Um. And so, I mean, so, so, kind of, we've got, kind of, just nothing's happening. We've got, kind of, got this blockage. So, I mean, like, I kind of, before we move on to what are the opportunities, now, I kind of just want to touch specifically on a bit on sort of like austerity and buses because I think that has been a big mm. problem. Yeah, yeah, it has been in terms of how services have um, cut back yeah and i yeah, i live in a town now which more people catch buses than anywhere else in the uk and that's brighton i'm gonna can i feel i we have bus congestion we have so many buses you know in yeah. brighton yeah, yeah and then they're always <laughs> um but it's still it's um is it regulated is it still regulated in brighton i mean like it's run by um the, the big operator is go ahead mm -hmm. and then um then there's also some services by stagecoach as well that do the longer distance type ones mm -hmm. um but um i think a lot of the issues around well it's a big issue in, in everything that we've talked about as well is the kind of is ticketing and pricing and concessions and that kind of thing yeah because that's that's really that's a really important element of if you know if you're trying to get encourage people back into I don't know, back into work, back into training, ha and having to use transport, then there needs there needs where, to be concessions. Where rural bus services exist, they're really expensive as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And well, that is, I think, cost is a really big yeah, yeah, challenge. Yeah, I, I live in it? Kent. Buses are expensive in Kent. Um, you know, everybody complains about traffic congestion, but um, I believe it's still true that children don't get half fare. No, and I I read something about that because they, of, they pay full fare because yeah. they're travelling in commuter time. Yeah, which um, to me is utterly ludicrous. Because um, 
and this is I mean because I, I kind of you know, thought you know where does the Equality Act sit in all of this you know um, and because I did read about you know because concessionary fares for um, older people shall we say retired mm -hmm. uh, uh, set in legislation aren't they although I didn't realize until recently that they'd <laughs> secretly linked it to the retirement latest retirement age for women mm, which is yeah. now 67 yeah so so when, when we moved to Brighton my husband thought he was going to get a bright, uh, bus pass <laughs> no you've got to wait another seven years sir <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So where's so is that yeah. so so is that discriminatory because different authorities are applying policy different? Yeah. No. I don't. Well, no. Not under yeah. the law, but it's interesting. But under the Equality isn't it? Act. Under the Equality Act. Because my husband's not working. Right. He is retired. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think that applies. <laughs> yeah. But what I do but think is that, which is something that the UK 2070 Commission has, pulled, you know, also talked about quite a lot when we're talking about inequality and tackling all of this is that devolution because obviously devolution will have a big sh could should have a big impact I mean if you look at London it ha has a much fairer and easily accessible and streamlined yes uh, you know um, yeah. way of doing things in terms of ticketing and transport generally so I because think it's regulated it, yeah and because yeah and because it's devolved and you, and you have an authority so, don't you yeah so I mean that's it, 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 that will Hopefully, you know, as more as you know, transport for Greater Manchester and transport for the north and all the rest of it start to kind of. But that reinforces the city thing. The city it does reinforce it the city. It, it does. It does. I mean, I'm not talking. I'm talking about in terms of money. I'm talking about you know that that, that if you're you mean government grant. If you're looking at but, the fund, if you're looking at funding, but this is the, should. but this was the other thing that I was thinking because um, any concessionary fares for. Um, for younger people, you know, mm. whether it's underage or whether it's student, or whatever, is purely discretionary, yeah. according to what is available in local authorities. And of course, we've had um, something called austerity, although allegedly um, that is now finished. But <laughs> allegedly, allegedly seems to be introduced. Yes, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's um, a small breather. But then I um, I read an article which um, was from the. Guardian, I think it was. Was it from the Guardian? Um, Other no, no, it was a, no, it was from the Independent. <laughs> I did look at the Guardian and the Independent because there was a couple of stories. And and this 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 was a report about the um, about from the London tra um, not from the from the Transport Select Committee um, chaired by Lillian Greenwood MP, mm -hmm. and um, they were investigating about um, the reduction in um, public transport journeys in general and the bus cuts and in the evidence that was given um, 85 million journeys have been cut from buses in the last 10 years so that's two percent of all bus services have been cut um, and the local government association said that half of all bus services are at risk of being scrapped due to lack of funding and that councils were being forced to fill the gaps because of this lack of funding and there was currently a deficit uh, for concessionary fares and these are the ones that they legally have to provide of 652 million wow. now when you think I wonder how many councils have gone bankrupt now or in special measures three, three is it I think at last count yeah, yeah so you yeah. what you've got Northampton Sussex or um, West so East Sussex that have gone East Sussex I think and um, ooh, can't remember the other one but but yes and there's, but I mean, there's a, there's a whole chunk of councils that are, that are, that are, at, risk, that are at risk. Yes, absolutely. And they've got, you know, and they've got pressures with social services. Mm. Yeah, they've got pressures with education. You yeah, know. yeah, yeah. And transport's not. And I guess in some ways, my question is, does austerity have to last, or actually? Do we, you know, if we want these benefits, do we just have to accept and we need to be able to provide these things? We just need to pay more tax. Well, there's a question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, which would you, I mean, like, which would you prefer? Pay more tax but have cheaper transport services overall for everybody that would benefit everybody. Well, I mean, I mean like, if you had a choice of, you know, sort of, let's say, 2% more tax a year, but your train fares, for example, were going to come down by half. What was your alternative? The alternative to what? You're saying either or. What's the or? 
well that was it yeah or or, or do we just carry on the way we are where yeah we just keep you know, where we keep just cutting services we keep cutting our infrastructure we keep you know putting train fares up I mean, because train fares have gone up 20 percent in real terms yeah. over since privatization you know is that good for getting people to work for running our economy is that a we good are policy taking us down a very dangerous road <laughs> back into politics heavy politics here Joanna. i mean i don't want to you know i don't want to call my hand out right now you know I could, be, I, could be, I could be accused of being a rampant socialist if i if i uh if I, if I tell you what i really think but i think that um what i do think is that there has to be if you're going to rebalance the economy and the government talks about rebalancing the economy such a lot but it doesn't there's no what's the action backing that up and I yeah think what we're talking everything that we've talked about on today has been to say that actually there has to be an integrated transport system in this country to back up this rebalancing and that supports our economy and it supports and what our we economy. need to deliver and if you look at all of the areas that we've talked about the coastal areas rural areas i mean we are all in a bubble in the southeast aren't we let's face it all three of us live in the southeast so we all experience very good transport infrastructure in the main um I mean, obviously, I get on HS1, which is a pre premium service, so um, it is, it is, it is an expensive service, but an excellent service. Um, so there's lots of things that you can, and you know, that's a difficult conversation to have around fares at the moment, isn't it? Because obviously, it is, it is, it is all privatised. But I think that the, the, you know, if you look at these areas that are outside of that bubble, you know, coastal areas, you know, areas up in the Midlands and parts of the north, where there are, you know really really significant issues around unemployment then transport has to be in the picture there and when, the, when you're talking about how to um, bring some of those areas up in terms of productivity and, and I and think that's I, mean, I think that is really important and I mean you're right about the South East bubble I'm mean, like, completely I'm mean, because like, twice in my life I've moved and in both those times I've moved from those types of regions back into the South East. Mm. So I, I grew up in Great Yarmouth, mm. you know, which is one of the, I, mean, I think if you look at the Department of Transport map on most deprived transport areas in the country, mm. Great Yarmouth is there in bright red. Yeah, but it'll also um, be on the deprived in other, it in other is, yeah. aspects. Um, is and I, I mean, I've not lived there for 30 years. <laughs> and the reason I moved was because the transport's bad. There's no jobs unless you work um, in the um, in the tourism. Mm. Yeah, um, and there was a lot more work there when I lived there. You know, so you had I mean, like Norfolk Line were there. Um, all the big, you know, all the big um, shipping companies were there, and I don't think any of that is there anymore. Mm. Yeah, you know, so it's got worse, and also the transport service has got worse because when I lived there, there used to be a direct intercity service there as well, and that's not been there for twenty-five years. But maybe. that's the trouble, isn't it? What we talked so, about earlier about that, you know, yeah. demand versus is and how, to, how to re look at making yeah. that business case, isn't it? And then, um, and then I've just moved from the Midlands, mm. so I lived in Oakham, one of those towns I'm saying has been created into a dormitory town I mean I think the high street is now full of charity shops and coffee shops because that's all that can be sustained now um, whilst I lived there the whole time I was there I was campaigning for a half hourly service train service the business case does stack up but because of um, lack of franchising that's been going on on the cross-country franchise and lack of rolling stock and all stuff to do with electrification it hasn't happened even though it has been in the franchise agreement for 12 years to deliver a half hourly service and just on sort of like going back to the bus point was that uh, because I was quite heavily involved in the local politics there is that um, last year um, the bus company withdrew a bus service from one of the local villages yeah. um, and it's not doesn't have a train service people relied on this to go to work I mean that people were relying on on this bus service to get to work so the council had to step in um, to um, to subsidize it but one of the things that when I was looking at it is that this this pl this place Wissendeen is 23 miles from Leicester and that's where that's where people are going for hospital appointments for education yeah. and that it takes you 40 minutes to drive it 
If you want to go by public transport, depending on the time of day you travel, it can take you anything between an hour and 15 minutes and two and a half hours. Mm, which is ridiculous. Because there is no, going to do that. Because there's no direct bus service yeah, there yeah, now yeah. anymore. The bus service takes you to Oakham. The, the bus service doesn't connect into the train. Um, and so if you've got a hospital appointment or something, which is where you'd go to, you'd go to less than hospital, but how are you supposed to get to hospital for health care or whatever? Another bit so. of the public sector has to fill the gap. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> and that's what it is. It's just sort of like pushing paper dollars all yeah, over the place, yeah. isn't it? But on a, I mean, if we want to finish on a bit more of a positive note, um, looking at a service like High Speed One, which is obviously the first high speed line in, um, that was built in the UK, just celebrating its 10 year anniversary. Um, that service has had a massively um, productive impact on all of those coastal towns down in the southeast. Because, you know, yeah. all of those towns, Margate, Ramsgate, Broadstairs, Faversham, Ashford, all those ta all those towns that were actually quite, particularly Margate, very, um, uh, you know, suffering from the usual decline that those kind of Victorian seaside towns have suffered over the, over decades. Um, high unemployment, not much work around, lots of those areas are where, frankly, local authorities dump off people like mm. looked after children because they don't want to house them in their own boroughs so they've got a whole plethora of issues in those areas and they're all stemming from you know basically social inequality um, and that line has had a big impact on improving the um, local economy in all of those areas so it is it, you know that is a real kind of you can really evidence that, you know, and that when you look at so the evidence is there the evidence that transport there. can and, have and, a positive and, impact and, and also it's had a massively um, a massively positive impact actually on the t and on, on their tourism narratives of all of those towns which was i think quite unexpected but they did bring out a report i think last year which showed that they'd had a phenomenal increase in their tourism numbers in all of those towns. Yeah, been there for days and that's because you can get there very quickly you, and very, you know, the, those, tra those trains are fast yeah. and reliable and nice. Like, nice, you know, when, nice yeah. Do you nice think high travel. speed one has been more successful than people predicted? Mm, absolutely. And got, do you it's think. It's got like 11% on year growth. And do you think the. The people who lived in these towns thought that they would benefit from that. Um, no, and I think I don't think they did completely. And I think what is interesting when you hear at the moment all the kind of very negative narrative around HS2 and knocking down, you know, ancient woodland and all of the negative stuff that's being put out in the media at the moment very disappointingly from environmental groups which I find extraordinary I have to say that all these quite significant environmental groups are coming out against a public transport system oh, it's but there you are sorry <laughs> sorry I'm saying that but I, I know I, I find but, it um, weird as well <laughs> but equally on HS1 I remember because I live in the area so I do remember there was a lot of ancient wood not, that was had to be um, removed to put uh, to, to build HS1 there were there were the usual mitigations replanting all that of thing everybody moaned and moaned and moaned and moaned about it until it was all open and then everyone just said oh isn't this the lovely transport you know system that we've now got in kent don't we all just love it so you know i'm, I'm hoping that the same will, ha will happen for hs2 because i think people are very kind of the trouble is people don't get into the detail you know and actually we haven't got a problem with ancient woodland in this country so you know there's plenty of it and you can knock it you, you can chop it down and start again it's not the end of the world you know there are bigger picture things here i think so everyone's very happy with hs1 in and i know i think there's a great picture <coughs> from high speed one where the cut and cover was done mm. and it's like here's the what it looked like before here's what it looked like um in construction here it is now spot mm. the difference yeah yeah exactly <laughs> it's fantastic they did some brilliant you know sound mitigation all that sort of thing and i mean obviously that because of all of that technology is you know it's developing at a rate of knots so i would imagine that hs2 will be uh, you know several steps ahead of that um this time around so um yeah it's a it's a it's a really really positive um story from 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 hs1 and i hope that hs2 ends up we end up talking about that in 20 years and saying how marvelous it is 
So we're going to finish on a positive note. So good news story, high speed one. Transport yeah, can make a difference. And I was going to say one positive thing from everybody, but do you want to say something else before we say yeah, one positive thing from for everybody? You, you started off <laughs> with a local authority policy role, <laughs> and now you're in more of like a delivery industry. Would you recommend that as a, for people to help make a difference, or should they stay in the policy? Um, mm, I don't know. I think it's. Uh, I think what's important is for people to dip in and out of other areas, and I think it's it's interesting that. Um, I mean, we talk a lot. Obviously, I work a lot on a, on HS two related, you know, work and. One of the things we talk about a lot is how to bring innovation into the supply chain. And oh, I don't think we'll talk about that. Yes, we do. It's <laughs> <laughs> a quick plug for us. Start up early events. <laughs> but um, you know, one of the things that, um, that that I think all of our uh, all of the suppliers into HS2 at the moment are looking at is how to get people from different industries into to come into rail because that's when you get that cross you know that cross sexual learning or whatever you call it you know that's when you get people having different ideas about doing things I mean I don't know how you sort out government to do that because I have to say that's what they need to do you know they need to stop working in their departmental silos and get out and speak to other colleagues in other departments I appreciate they do that but if they need if, if we're going to have a proper properly integrated transport system in this country that's what needs to happen is the government's government departments need to talk to each other Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was going to sort of like, from everybody, ask what would be the one thing that you think could really improve transport inequality that we could, you know, solve, you know, on a, on a looking at the opportunities. Um, for me, it would be just giving all young people free travel. And what age would you? Is that sort of like you know, um, school age? If you're in full time education, yeah, full time education, I think. Yeah. Controversial, I know. I don't think it is because well, it's not I because I had they do it in I, London. <laughs> well, they do it in London, but I I think up until I went to university, I always had free travel. Not on trains, but on buses. I used to get a, used to get it from my college every term, like this little card or something. I might have paid ten pounds a term for it, but it was, mm. it was. Yeah, know, I think I think we did as well. Yeah. yeah. I would say public sector buses. Yeah. Or taking them back into public sector ownership. Or, or filling the country full of more buses, basically. More buses. Because bus bus there was a picture. I saw a picture today where it showed sort of like. Did you did you see it on? I think it might have been on LinkedIn. I think it might have come out of um, the European Transport Commission or something, um, where they showed um, sort of like how many people you know from seventy seven cars or something you know, can fit onto a bus, and it's like two buses. <laughs> yeah, and how much better the streets are because I have to say, coming up Whitehall today, you know, the one thing you can say about you know the Extinction Rebellion protest, it was lovely walking through Parliament Square and up Whitehall because there's no traffic because yeah. they've blocked all the roads off. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you're only just walking up and down, you know, and it's lovely. It always feels like a party. So, <laughs> so thank you, Extinction Rebellion. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going to follow on with, um, I'm, with designing streets for people. Mm. You know, actually starting from an individual level and then thinking about how we need to, to how our transport needs need to be met because they don't always need to be about about the car and we should be designing streetscapes for more active transport so that we can walk and we can cycle better on our streets and also so that they're actually designed for public transport and integrated in with rail hubs yeah, yeah. so that we're creating communities that's a good one We'll let that one in. <laughs> oh, it's like room 101, isn't yeah, it? Take, take we're bringing them in rather than, let, <laughs> rather than putting them in a room. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very interesting conversation.